I'll tell you that we had the first meeting we had was also on field schools. We are trying to support the Uganda office for the training which will, which is taking which will be taking place in the Karamoja region. So we spent uh, some time with them discussing the program and uh, our master trainers will be involved in the training including some of us remotely but the master trainers will be there fully to support them so i think that is a very big advantage and value add to the field school hub we couldn't finish the meeting because uh, there were some delays from their side so but we shall reconvene so i want to welcome you to this session uh, our usual Wednesday sessions that we are sharing experience from very experienced colleagues. Uh, so I welcome the presenters for today and all of you to this session. And I will leave uh, the moderation for the session. I'll be coming on and off, but I'll be participating fully. So I give the moderation of this session to Edwin. Over to you, Edwin, and we take off. Ah, before you come on, I think I should, as usual, have to recognize very key people in this room. Uh, first of all, all the master trainers are here. This is good news for me. Uh, normally, I find it difficult to find Opio and Fred. So today, they are here. This is great. I also welcome our good brother, Ori, from uh, FAO Addis Regional Office. You are welcome, Ori and all of you. So, again, over to you, Edwin. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, Max, and thank you, participants, for setting time to come and learn from us or learn with us on the two topics that we've set for today. So we will begin with uh, our first presenter, Madam Grace Njagi. Madam Grace Njagi, is the program lead or the component lead for community capacity building under an IFAD funded project called Aquaculture Business Development Support, the Business Development Program. And this program will be implemented, I think in a, correct me if I'm wrong, 14 counties of Kenya, but they've started with six. So please uh, allow us to invite Madam Grace Njagi and then later on, we'll have a second presenter. Thank you. Welcome, Madam Grace. You are free to share your screen. Yeah, good morning, everyone. This is Grace Jaggi from the Aquaculture Business mm -hmm. Development Program. And uh, um, it's a pleasure to be with you today to present on ABDB and what we are doing on AFS. Uh, I'll share my screen because I have a presentation. Yeah, so I'm an aquaculture specialist and I'm also the person who is leading the component one of the program. And uh, I'll outline what I'm going to present. So I'll tell you what ABDP is all about, what are the areas we are targeting, and uh, what are the components of the program, and how do we integrate the field schools, and then the possible areas of collaboration. So just a quick introduction is that, uh, this one is a joint funded program between the government of Kenya and IFAD, in which they did design mission and the program design report was developed by June of 2017. A financing agreement was signed in 2018 and the program became effective. However, the program was not launched until 29 April 2019. So we are looking at the second year of implementation. And like I said, uh, the program is funded by a loan from e fund GOK counterpart part funding and beneficiary contribution in cash or kind. And the overall goal of the program is to reduce poverty and increase food security and nutrition in those communities which are targeted by the program. With the overall program development objective of increasing the incomes, the food security and the nutrition status. So uh, we are targeting 15 counties in this particular program, though we are looking at it as national in scope, and the, the 15 counties targeted are from what we have termed as the central region and the western region. Though this central region consists largely of the Mount Kenya and central region, with the counties of Meru, 
Baraka nidhi embu kirinyaga. Nyeri kiambu machakos and kajiando. You realize kajiando is even in the Rift Valley. And machakos is even in the eastern, but we are calling it the bigger central region. Then in the western and Nyanza region, we have Busia, Siaya, Kisumu, Kisi, Homa Bay, Migori, and Kakamega. These were selected on the basis of high production, uh, existing infrastructure like the mini processing plants and the resources available for fish farming. So the program has three components. And component one is a smallholder aquaculture development. This one is all about production, productivity, and the nutrition from fish and incomes. There is a component two, which is on aquaculture value chain development. This one is looking at how can we improve the efficiency along the whole aquaculture value chain. And of course, we have component three, which is on program coordination and management, looking at matters of knowledge management, MND, finance, accounting, audit, and procurement. And at the program oversight, uh, the State Department for Fisheries and Blue Economy, which is in the Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock, Fisheries and Cooperatives, is the lead implementing agency for the program. And therein is the program steering committee, which is the, has the overall policy guidance for the program, and in which the PS is the chair for that PSC. The other members are PSCs, principal secretaries from National Treasury Devolution Cooperatives, Water, Irrigation, Labor, Social Services. And we get to see CCs from the implementing counties on rotation of basis to sit in that particular committee. And at the program administration, we normally have the program coordination unit and where I sit. This one is in Nyeri. We have a, uh, the national, the Nyeri National Office where we have a program coordinator, the aquaculture specialist, the finance, the accounts, the procurement, MND. And then we also have a regional coordination office in Kisumu. And also we have the support staff and the drivers. So the PCU reports to the PSC and we are the ones now responsible for coordinating to day-to-day -day management of the program in those 15 countries. So in targeting our beneficiaries, we are looking at the poverty targeting. We found it's very key on uh, the rural poor and then social inclusion, the livelihood targeting. We are looking at the three levels of beneficiaries, geographically targeting, and then direct targeting for women and youth and the disadvantaged groups. And then self-targeting in that all beneficiaries get capacity building in one place or another. So the direct beneficiaries are 35,500 house, households. So assuming that every household has six people, you get a direct beneficiary of 213 people. And these are the ones I was saying, three levels. So the level one and which forms the bulk is the small scale farmers who are producing at subsistence level meaning they produce at uh, less than 100 kgs of fish per year with one or two ponds, and they make up 70% of the total beneficiaries. And then at level two, we are looking at the farmers who normally produce with a surplus for market. So between 100 to 500 kgs per year, maybe they have three to five ponds, and they make up up to 27% of the beneficiaries. And then we have the ones who are directly targeted under component two. These are the specialized farmers they are more towards the commercial side. And this is the farmers we are looking up to for them to become independent aquaculture aggregators to be able to provide linkages along the value chain. And of course, the indirect beneficiaries for the program. So, uh, and then the field school integration is under component one of the program. It's under smallholder aquaculture development whose uh, outcome and objective and uh, indicated earlier and it is under subcomponent because component one has three subcomponents. Subcomponent one is a smallholder aquaculture production. And some of the activities which are in this subcomponent is community mobilization and group building, aquaculture infrastructure development, aquaculture input industry. So maybe let me just say something about each of the activities. So on community mobilization and group building, we want every farmer to, make, to belong to a group because we want the groups to be the institutional focus for capacity building, sourcing of inputs and primary marketing activities. So at the program level, we are looking to forming or strengthening 780, which we are calling smallholder aquaculture groups. At the aquaculture infrastructure development, we are looking at enhancing the aquaculture production base. So either doing new ponds or new production facilities and or rehabilitating the old ones that are there 
So this one will include the program will support farmers with materials like uh, for pond construction or, or like liners or, or predator nets or bird control nets. And the farmer is expected to give beneficiary counterpart con uh, beneficiary contribution in terms of labor and the other works. At the aquaculture input industry, we are looking at the fish farmers who are uh, doing cottage feeds or the ones who are doing hatcheries. So they'll be supported with technical capacity building, either to acquire raw materials, feed formulations for the cottage feeds, and for the hatcheries, technical capacity building and acquisition of better brood stock for them to be able to produce fingering. Now, the other activity is the aquaculture productivity, and this is where now AFS squarely falls under, because we are looking at getting the best out of what the units the farmers already have. And uh, I'll be expanding on that further. And then the other ac uh, activities, development of dam aquaculture, where we are looking at uh, restocking of community dams. We have to develop management plants. We have to do sampling and the uh, plant tree, fruit tree seedlings for them to be able to adapt to climate change and all that. So under aquaculture productivity, we are looking at imparting aquaculture technical and business training for smallholder fish farmers, and also develop sound practices for fish farming and train for those who are practicing cage catcher or aquaculture and man-made reservoirs. And then the model now we have, uh, we have adopted is the farmer field school. And through this technical capacity building, we hope that we will graduate 60% of the level one farmer to level two, where they stop producing for subsistence and they're able to produce with a surplus for market. And uh, since the program began, these are achievements that we have made. Uh, 152 officers have been trained on FFS methodology. Now, it's worth noting here that under uh, this training, the initial trainings were done under the FAOTCP collaboration program for Kenya. So then the, the main ABDB program had not begun. And the FAOTCP was the one in charge of training and follow up for those EFS which were done then. So the 152 officers have been trained both during the TCP and during the main program. And then a total of 84 groups. These were established under the FAOTCP program in six counties of ABDB. These are Western, we had Kakamega, Migori, and Homabi. And then in the Eastern, we had Kirinyaga, Meru, and Nyeri. And then they went ahead and trained and established AFS groups in an ABDB outlier county, this specifically Vihiga which is not part of the 15 counties that are implementing the program. And of, out of the 84, 12 groups have already been funded for season long learning and the others are in the process of being funded. And out of all the officers trained, we expect a total of 324 AFS groups to be formed. These are two AFS per sub-county in 162 sub-counties across the 15 ABDB implementing counties. And uh, yeah, these are peaks from the Sagana, the most recent FFS training was done in Sagana in July of this year. You can see some of the groups that were there and they, they have their slogan, their subgroup and all that which were formed. And these are some of the outputs for the learning process, identification of the problem trees and all that. And this was during a field visit to one of the level two farmers for them to uh, do the FESA and ISA. So the future of AFS groups, what about we have formed the AFS groups and they have done the season long learning. So they'll be linked to component two, which is the under sub component 2.1, which is more holder based aquaculture values, value chain development, where we have what we are calling the dependent aquaculture aggregators model. An independent aquaculture aggregator will be engaged by the program and they will offer linkages between the farmer groups either backward linkages to provide farmers with feeds and fingerings and forward linkages for them to be able to market the products for farmers, source good technologies and all that. So there'll be, the IAA will be gotten on through competitive bidding and they're supposed to do all that. Coach farmers on new technologies, they should procure fees, fish feeds and fingerings for farmers they're undertaking marketing and also commit to buy fish from the farmer. So this is our model IAA can see the responsibilities from the SAG, MBTP, and IEE. 
And for our purposes, if a group of farmers had been registered as an AFS, we are not going to be changing the name because it is already registered. But that is, we will crystallize our SAG, and those are the same groups we'll be working with. So this program will support them while through the IAA and the IAA will support the SAGs through backward and forward linkages. And then through the business competitive window, the groups can still go ahead and come up with a proposal and they'll be funded by the program. The proposals, uh, we have a maximum of 90 SAGs and to 50 ASCs to be funded with matching grants of up to 44% the cost of investment. So this is in a nutshell how the linkage will be from component one, you get all the smallholder farmers, individual farmers supported with materials. Then still under component one, they join an AS, AFS, AS, ASC, SAG, whichever the name of the group is, this is a working group. It is the same we are working with. Then to the component two, they are joined to the IA, and then they go to the least PPPs. And these ones we are looking at the mini processing plants. So, and we expect the group to participate in the uh, management of knowledge and monitoring and evaluation from planning to MD activities to evaluation and to reporting. And then uh, the data flow, as you can see, is from the community or village or the farmers themselves. So any data we will be getting from those AFS and from the farmers, it flows to the sub-county, it goes to the county, then it comes to the PCU level for consolidation. So areas of collaboration, we are looking at the technical capacity building for implementation of FFS. Remember, this is a new uh, approach in aquaculture. It has not been done before. And then service provision for the AFS knowledge exchange forums for farmers and then networking and linkages. And with that, I say thank you. Over to you, Andrew. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Madam Grace. And thank you members for being very attentive and not disruptive. Uh, I don't know what is the consensus. We go to the next presentation or we take in a few questions and answers. But I could also advise members to put their questions in the chat box or anything that requires elaboration. So I don't know, let's get a consensus of two or three. We get take some questions or we move to the next presentation and then answer questions at the end of it all. Uh, I suggest we take uh, questions on this presentation. Uh, once mm -hmm. we are done with it, we move on to the other presentation. Okay, that's one consensus. So this is 10.33. If we get to 10.40, we will stop and move to the next presentation. Is that okay? Good. So members, you are requested to put your hand up, you raise your hand up or put a question in the chat box. We can attend to two or three questions first. I'm trying to look for any raised hands. Any raised hands? So while waiting for that, Madam Grace Njagi, uh, we wanted to inform you that as the East African Field Schools Hub, our basic mandate is to ensure quality and quality of implementation of FFS programs. And at the same time, we are developing an MEL guide, Monitoring Evaluation and Learning Guide, that will basically assist us in tracking progress of field schools uh, groups and also looking at the sustainability of the groups after at the end of the program funding, what next for those groups. So uh, feel free, we have a team of master trainers, both here in Kenya and in the region who are readily available to support your program, be it virtually or also on uh, different targeted scheduled face-to-face -face visits or training or 
technical backstopping services. But you also have a dedicated Zoom channel that you can use it for your aquaculture groups. All you need to do is to let us know when you want to have those meetings. So without dominating so much, we could take one or two questions. Masai Mawari, Masai Mawira. Thank you. That please. Uh, just an, uh, it's not really a question, but uh, just an observation and maybe experience sharing. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we had, uh, uh, well, the presentation was very good. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you, Madam, for that uh, very comprehensive presentation. And uh, my quick observation is that uh, uh, when we look at uh, uh, field schools from the day they started up to where we are today, I can only compare what aquaculture is doing with what the Kenya Forest Service did at some point. And uh, looking at how that uh, Kenya Forest Service uh, field school group uh, operated and uh, the, how it ended, uh, I can only advise that uh, the aquaculture group, either through Jen Detti, who is still there at Kenya Forest Service, or even sharing of uh, what transpired and uh, borrow a, a leaf in terms of uh, uh, the linkage with the field schools and uh, documentation processes and uh, sustainability issues. I'm uh, more on the sustainability issues and at the end of the day, uh, upscaling of uh, this very important intervention. So if you could uh, maybe link up with Gendetti or uh, uh, through Edwin, uh, you link up with uh, Shinji Ogawa, you will see what, uh, what, uh, what went right, what went wrong with Kenya Forest Service field schools, and then uh, maybe try and see where this aquaculture program uh, could also benefit from those experiences. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Masai. Uh, I'll ask Madam Dr. Muindi also to, to air her, her question or, or compliments or sentiments, and then uh, we can ask Madam Grace to respond. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you very much, uh, Grace, for the very comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, uh, from your presentation, there is something which uh, came in my mind as you were presenting. I heard that uh, the trainees will move from component one, then they go to component two, but I, I did not hear whether you are going to empower some of the extension officers who are constantly working with the, those farmers. So that maybe after the exit of the project, they'll continue uh, working with the farmers and also maybe taking the technology to another level. Maybe you can uh, give us uh, some information on that. Thank you. Over to you. Well, thank you. Thank you for those two questions or in comments. So, Madam Grace Njagi, perhaps you could respond. Okay. Thank you so much. And uh, I'd like to respond to the question on empowering of the extension officers. So the trainees you are seeing are actually extension officers at the county level. And uh, we are training them to become AFS facilitators because they have to go through the process of the season long learning and graduate the groups. That being said, they are our, what should I call, foot soldiers. And every capacity building we are doing, it first goes to them. They are the beneficiaries because they are responsible for each sub-county. So we train them first before they can go to the farmers. So these are the people who are actually going to be more empowered by the program. Right now, we have what we are calling the technical assistant at the county level, made up of two officers, uh, a graduate and that diploma level. And we have already uh, gotten them with tablets, which have already been installed with data kits for them to be able to collect data and, and uh, disseminate and also report to the PCU. So these extension officers are, will actually be the most empowered at the end of the program because there are also uh, opportunities for exchange learning for them. 
like now some of them have already gone to Kenya School of Government for training on program management. So we are empowering them. We are not leaving them at this. We expect them to be better at the end of the program. Thank you, and over to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Madam Grace. And I think it's 10.41. Kindly allow me to introduce the next presenter. Uh, the next presenter is uh, Dr. Esther Mwindi. She's a, a lecturer at Puan University. Uh, and she's also a field school master trainer, having gone through the season long training at Puan University, which they further on went to implement with the communities. So for the last two or three years, she's been deeply immersed in former field school. So today she's going to talk to us about the FS or former field schools e-learning program that we want to roll out for the region. And this will also be of benefit even to Madam Grace Njagi with your program. The people that you might not reach, we can also link them up to our e-learning program. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mwindi, please proceed. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> good morning once more. My name is Zubada Esther Mwindi. I'm a lecturer at Pwani University, which is based in Kilifi along the Kenyan coast. Uh, as you've heard, I'm a FFS master trainer. And uh, in the university, I'm a lecturer and researcher in the field of agronomy with the bias on soil and water resource management. I'm also a gender mainstreaming expert in agriculture. Today, I'll be giving a small highlight on uh, FFS e-learning program. And uh, as we go along, uh, I'll give my views. And afterwards, I'll give you an opportunity to give us some more input or maybe we can also have a discussion. I start by giving us more background information, which uh, I know we all know, but not bad to keep on repeating. As we know, FFS uh, methodology is a unique extension approach. And the reason as to why it's unique compared to all other extension approaches is because it's a group-based learning process, which brings concepts and methods from agroecology, uh, uh, participants' experimentations, and also participants' experiences, brings them together to enable them to make their own decisions. We, it's a very uh, unique extension approach which can lead to realization of sustainable agriculture and also sustainable development in other areas apart from agriculture, because it helps farmers or trainees to make their own independent local decisions. It, because they do, the, the, they combine the agroecology with their own experimentations and also with their own experiences, they are able to choose the kind of crops which they want to adopt and why, the kind of livestock and also the management practices which they want to adopt and why, the kind of enterprises which are uh, to adopt and why, and also the kind of technologies to accept and the ones to refuse and having their own reasons without uh, just the way we normally do extension officers or researchers coming and just introducing a technology, then they adopt it, then within a certain season, they adopt it. This ensures that once they adopt a technology, they are able to carry it along because it comes from them, not from the researchers or extension officers. Despite the importance of this unique extension approach, we, uh, we can agree that the uptake of this methodology has been very low over the years. And some of the reasons why it has, it has been long is due to limited uh, expert pool across the world and more so in the in the interior regions in the interior and also limitations of infrastructure among other factors um, i want us to ask ourselves if this methodology uh, uptake has been low and one of the reason is because the expert pool is still limited 
which are some of the methods which we can use to improve the availability of uh, expert pool. One of the methods is uh, to increase capacity building. Capacity building can be increased by several approaches, among others, I've just listed a few. A few. One of the approaches that we can, we can be used is expansive training of the FFS methodology. Uh, another approach is, is continuous empowerment of existing experts on some critical areas like curriculum development for different enterprises. Because you find that uh, anytime you're approaching farmers or, or any group, uh, you need a unique curriculum. If it's forest, you need a curriculum for forestry. If it's irrigation, uh, uh, crop diseases, crop pests, uh, plant nutrition, we need different types of curriculum. So empowering uh, existing experts on how to make different curriculums and make very good curriculums will also assist in uh, improving the, the, the methodology. Then the other way is refresher courses for existing active uh, experts. This is because uh, you realize that the way technology was in the early 70s and early 80s is keeping on changing. And if uh, these experts were trained in the early 80s and 70s or 90s, they might be lacking in one way or another on some of the modern trends. And once they go to take the, the, the extension methodology or to go and assist farmers or the, the learners outside there, they might be limited in one way or another. So refresher courses are important. Capacity building of policy makers and formulators is also very important. To enable, because these are the guys who normally push things to happen and also encourage or discourage closed doors and, and, and also open doors. So if their capacity build on the importance of uh, this methodology and what role it plays in our society, it can play a role in improving it. Then the other one is empowerment of existing experts uh, on the area of resource mobilization. Or the area of sourcing for, for grants. This is because this methodology needs some experimentation. If uh, we have the expert pool, but we don't have, the, the, the experts are there, but they don't have resources. They are going to, uh, for example, they're going to approach the farmers from the groups, but this group will need some little resources or capital to do the experimentation, which now will limit the, the efficiency of their work. So these experts who are already existing, they need to be taught some small skills on resource mobilization to be able to mobilize the resources uh, in their own way to take the, the methodology to another level. To increase uh, uh, to capacity build, we can do it. It can be done through face-to-face -face or e-learning method. We all know that a uh, face-to-face method is the traditional way of instruction where students and teachers attend an in-person uh, session. And this is the methodology which is common and which has been happening since when FFS was introduced uh, all over the world, which is still okay and works very well. But as, as time goes on and as modernization comes, we realize that there are some limitations which are coming up with technology. Uh, E-learning is another alternative which is coming up and coming out very strong and it involves utilization of electronic technologies to assess educational curriculum outside traditional classroom. Now, when we compare online learning and face-to-face, uh, -face, uh, I'll just give you some little, some few comparisons. We realize that in face-to-face, -face, uh, this method is fixed and learners have to be in a certain place within a certain time and learn from, from uh, with, the, with the, every other infrastructure already set. But online is, is flexible. Learner can learn at his own time and uh, this flexibility of where you'll be and uh, what you'll be doing at any particular time. Face to face, uh, normally there is, it involves delivering knowledge. While online, 
in, 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 uh, in force facilitation learning. This is where the facilitator, the one who is teaching won't be there to just pump in knowledge, but will be facilitating the learner, but the learner has to pull himself or herself to read and understand and also do what it pertains to the course. Then in face-to-face, -face, uh, is teacher-led. The trainees have to wait until the teacher or the trainer comes and tells them what to do. But online uh, learning, mostly the people who normally enroll in online learning, they are people who have a need and they know what they want and they have already decided because they want this, they have to enroll to this thing and they dig deep, they normally dig deep to understand because already they came with a self drive. Vis-a-vis the teaching led, which we normally say is also conditioned, uh, sometimes like in our normal situations, we find that when, once we, we organize, for example, for a training, sometimes uh, some of the members will come because they are self-driven, others will come because it's a project, for example, project funded by IFAD or by World Bank, and it has some uh, RDMs. Maybe it's a project which is funded and is being hosted in the city, and I've never been in the city, so I also want to go and uh, see what is in the city. And uh, sometimes it's not, it's not, uh, you find that sometimes it's not, the, 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 the output sometimes is not 100% because the person who came for the training was not self-motivated. I mean, did not come because of self-drive, but became, uh, came because uh, he had some other interests. So that's also another difference between an online training and face-to-face. Uh, face-to-face, uh, -face, again, when we are measuring performance, we measure by use of tests, quizzes, exams, participation, et cetera, et cetera. But in online training, it's normally not easy to measure uh, performance, but performance can be monitored using some designed tools. Face-to-face -to -face is limited. It, it has to have a limited uh, time and also limited audience because uh, uh, getting people together, it might need uh, maybe you secure a hall, maybe you give them some uh, lunch, etc., etc., and it cannot go for a long time. And again, the audience, uh, the number of audience is limited, maybe 10 or 15, depending on the, the funds available. But for online learning, this one can target a wide range of interested uh, audience as much as possible. And the audience can be derived from all over the world, so long as the audience is deeply motivated, disciplined, and uh, he, the audience, the person really knows what he wants. That means if uh, online learning can be able to reach out and empower more resource people in uh, FFS methodology compared to face-to-face, -face, not uh, leaving, uh, keeping all the other factors constant. Now, when we look at uh, also the advantages of online learning, we find that online learning is, a good, is as good as face-to-face, -face, depending on the structure and the infrastructure and how it has been uh, prepared. In online learning, students learn more and they normally take full control over what they are learning. Because they work at their own speed, they spend time they, on what they want to learn most and what they don't understand, and also rush in the areas where they understand or where they don't have problems with. Uh, online learning, most of the times, it has high retention rates because of the self drive because no, no one will just enroll in an online learning to waste one or two, three hours if, uh, if at all it doesn't have self-drive and it doesn't mean something in that, that training. Then uh, online learning has lower investment because uh, there's no wastage of time communicating with classmates, filling in uh, course documents, giving stories, giving so many arguments. So it, it has less time investment and it has also less uh, resources investment in terms of uh, training. And uh, there's also reduced assessment, uh, frequent assessments, which reduces distractions. And again, 
uh, as I have mentioned, it has low investment on resources because it cuts back on paper, electricity, uh, carbon emissions, etc. Et and also the resources which are needed to, to bring uh, learners together and train them is lower compared to if you have face to face where you have to organize everything, a room and everything. Then uh, in online learning, just the same way as face to face, uh, you can track learner's patterns and it can be tracked by use of uh, analytical tools which can be meant and put well in structure. And these analytical tools can also be replicated even to be applied as they go to do their work in the, on the ground. Then when they are presenting their work, it can be used to analyze what they have already done and the, the kind of supervision they have gotten when they were on the ground. In a nutshell, we can say that uh, uh, best empowerment and capacity building approach, this is a very uh, good empowerment and capacity building approach to reach a large pool of uh, experts, to, um, to enrich a large pool of uh, experts worldwide within a short period and with the limited resources holding all the other factors are constant. Now, having now that uh, nutshell of uh, the importance of uh, e-learning or e-learning as face-to-face, uh, we can ask ourselves then, why e-learning in a in, uh, few school? Uh, just to give you, uh, you a small background, we realize that e-learning or training has been utilized in the modern era by several organizations, including uh, universities, and also including the FAO eLearning Academy, to reach out and ensure that a large pool of experts worldwide are impacted with knowledge and skills and ushered out to serve the society within a short period of time. Uh, and more so now in the face of COVID-19 pandemic, although even e-learning started even before COVID, we realized that now with the problem of uh, social distancing, uh, inability to travel large distances, and also inability to have, uh, to have people meeting, a large pool of people meeting together, e-learning comes in early because uh, the trainee can be trained through e-learning then allowed to go to the field and do the practical bit of the field once once he understands he or she understands the the the, the, the literature part of it and uh, as we mentioned we have a uh, deficiency of from a uh, field school expert pool and because of this need to be able to reach uh, to have enough expert pool who can reach out to more farmers or more FS players and contribute to improve food security, landscape management, environmental conservation, and livelihood, etc. etc. There is need for to, to come up or to adopt or to move with the modern world and be able now to look for another avenue of free out and empowering our expert pool so that we can be able to be at par with the world. Some of the approaches that we are, that can be followed to achieve this is, is uh, the e adopting the e-learning. And uh, we know that uh, adoption of the e-learning in FF, FS, because we know FS is answer, is uh, a little bit, uh, is a long process, which is tedious, but uh, it has to be started from somewhere. And some of the, the, the activities which gets into the basket of ensuring that uh, e-learning is achieved in, in FS, some of the activities which can be adopted is, uh, needs to be adopted is development and updating of existing FS materials, uh, making e-learning courses, uh, making of uh, designing of e-learning modules, uh, designing and also training, designing of curriculum for different uh, enterprises and also empowering uh, other experts on how to make the curriculums and uh, designing of learners 
which can be used to suit different FS players and learners. Um, there is also a need to carry out training on curriculum development to all existing experts because most of the time you realize that experts, I might be an expert in uh, soil, but when I go to the farm, I realize that uh, it needs water or it needs uh, agronomy. So the existing uh, experts, they also need to be empowered on curriculum development at their own level, both facilitators and also master trainers, so that they can be able to reach out to farmers or the other trainees with, uh, with the power and with confidence. Because as we know now, you find that uh, if I was trained in the early 70s or 80s, I might be lacking, as I mentioned before, I might be lacking on what has developed now, which I also need to be given some refresher, which still uh, gets in in the approaches to achieve the FS uh, e-learning. Um, I'm going to illustrate uh, just a small um, process uh, uh, which uh, is going to be followed, but is not in a nutshell, is not complete. Some things we can keep on being in how to go to the e-learning. In the, in the development of e-learning courses and module to make sure that uh, FS e-learning is working, there is need to review the core FFS documents. Uh, and after reviewing, there is also need to review again and analyze the existing FFS training module content and the mm -hmm. monitor, uh, including the monitoring and evaluation uh, and uh, the, the FS guides. After review, the, the review and the analysis, there is need to synthesize the already available e-courses and modules which have already been developed by FAO. Uh, and this will be done in consultation with uh, the FAO team. Then after the synthesis, the e-courses, the final e-courses will be developed. And uh, the e-courses which need to be developed is one for policy makers, another one for trainers, and another one for policy formulators. Uh, this, that will be the start, then the others will follow later. Then after the design, as they are being designed, uh, in the design, there will be incorporation of mod media tools, clips, et cetera, et cetera, to make the course complete and also the modules complete and also appealing as somebody raised to be able to understand it very well. Then once the documents are ready, they'll be pre-tested by being presented to panel of experts who are FFS players in different uh, areas for them to critique and also to input on what might be lacking. Then after the revision, the online guidelines of how to learn, how to learn and also to how to train, that is the e-manuals will be prepared. And after that, the document will be ready and now it can be used to train resource persons. This, uh, the first, uh, the resource persons to be trained will be mostly the available trainers. They'll be trained on uh, how to develop the modules and also how to carry out the training. Then they can now be rolled out to go and uh, train more players in order to increase now the expert pool. As this one is going on, uh, we have universities, which are maybe they have already integrated now institutionalized uh, FFS, or they're in the process of institutionalizing FFS, and uh, they'll be supported uh, to ensure that uh, as they do the normal FFS training, the face-to-face, -face, they'll also integrate also the e-learning uh, in the university. Just the way you find that most universities, even now in Africa, are already teaching online, their courses online. We also want, as they teach their courses online, we also provide them with the capacity also to teach our e, our FFS uh, online and in the right way. So they'll also be supported throughout the universities to make sure that uh, they integrate our 
e-learning course in the right way and also deliver in the right way. So to be able to reach our trainers and make sure that they are well capacity built. Uh, as this, uh, as I said that uh, these changes are not complete, there are also some small, small bits which are missing in between. So once the review is being done, there will be some stakeholders consultation. Uh, so we have some meetings to with stakeholders and also other trainers and also university players to ensure that the e-learning course which is going to come out will be a quality one and will be acceptable to all. And also in the process, there'll be curriculum, uh, steps of curriculum development in between and also training different players, master trainers and others on how to develop curriculum, FFS curriculums for different enterprises and also different activities like irrigation, uh, pastoralism, et cetera, et cetera. So there are so many other activities which are, will be integrated in the whole process. And we are, we, we are believing that by the time the process is complete, we are going to have a e-learning course which is uh, already running and uh, the e-learning course is going to take our FFS now into the modern world and able to reach out to more farmers and more uh, players and take this technology to a higher level of helping livelihood of many in the world. Thank you very much. Uh, over to you, Eddie. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Muinde, for Windy for, for that elaborate presentation on uh, the FFS e-learning. Uh, and we are anticipating to have these ones rolled out by early next year, so that those ones who cannot get time can also attend to self-paced learning. So I will just relate to the members. If you have a question, please put it in the chat box to both Dr. Mwindi and uh, Madam Jaggi, and then we proceed, or else you raise your hand. So we have another 13 minutes to go. Oh, before, while you're getting ready, maybe Ori, you could also just elaborate on the regional initiative on FFS e-learning. Ori, if you can hear me. Seems to have lost him. So, Masai, please proceed. Thank you, Eddie. Asante Daktari for that uh, very passionate, uh, clear presentation that has really opened uh, uh, our minds uh, as we move towards uh, digitalization, even in FFS. Why I didn't put my questions or comments in the chat box, I have uh, quite a number of them. I'm not even sure whether I will share everything, but I'll, I'll take bit by bit and give other people a chance. But what touched me most as we started off in the background, uh, we mentioned the uh, different uh, me methods that we use in the FFS training, but I didn't hear, maybe it escaped my attention, any mention of the non-formal education methods, uh, for example, the use of folk media in reaching out to our farmers, in addition to what has already been said. So if in your presentation, you could uh, maybe say something about uh, the use of non-formal education methods and folk media and things like that. That is uh, one. Number two, in terms of uh, uh, in the improvement aspects, I was looking at issues of sustainability. Uh, why we have not moved uh, as fast as expected. I think uh, we have had challenges with issues of sustainability in the whole uh, field schools approach. Uh, we are doing much, but uh, once the project uh, comes to an end, it's like uh, there, were, there were no plans to sustain the whole uh, uh, system or approach. Then you, we could also look at uh, institutionalization. We have had challenges with that. Uh, I'm also looking at networking. We have quite a number of big projects, each one of them giving FFS prominence, but then there's little communication between uh, projects. I'm looking at 
example of NARIG, the World Bank funded project, which is countrywide, and now the aquaculture program, if there was a mechanism of uh, experience sharing between these big projects, commercialization. When we started first, we were really into the learning phase and the commercialization phase. I'm still insisting that when we, we give priority to commercialization, uh, we will enable farmers or uh, other beneficiaries to pay for the services rendered long after uh, maybe a project closes. And if services are paid for, then uh, we, we can be sure of uh, issues of sustainability. So those were my observations in the presentation. Uh, then uh, on the uh, where we were comparing face-to-face uh, -face and uh, e-learning, uh, I, I was not very sure in terms of uh, <clears throat> uh, what we were saying about face-to-face uh, 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 -face being teacher-led, uh, delivery of knowledge. What we have always been saying in uh, field schools, this is a participatory approach. So whether it is face-to-face -face or uh, e-learning, I would really expect us to emphasize on the issue of participatory approaches so that it's not a question of the facilitator leading the process. Uh, if we really emphasize on participatory approaches, then the issue of uh, the, the teacher delivering knowledge, uh, the, the, the teacher leading the process, these are issues which, uh, uh, whether e-learning or face-to-face, -face, they, they should really not arise. Finally, uh, when we look at e-learning, as much as uh, this is the way we are going, especially with COVID-19, but uh, where I come from, we still have challenges with technology. Even now, when we are looking at WhatsApp and Zoom meetings and all that, you look uh, in a village, you want people to meet through Zoom, and you find it's only maybe five people who can access to uh, that application. So uh, as much as we are, yes, we are saying yes to e-learning, but let's look at our people, uh, whether extension staff, farmers, are they really prepared uh, with this uh, technological advancement so that we can incorporate them into uh, e-learning? Uh, last, last, Kabisa. Uh, in in e-learning, uh, maybe it's food for thought for all of us. How do we ensure, and this is an area of emphasis, we have hands-on experience uh, when it comes to learning and uh, looking at e-learning? Uh, maybe we can start thinking about uh, that aspect of hands-on experience, which on face-to-face, -face, uh, there's no question about it. But how about e-learning? How does the learner get hands-on experience in the learning process? Thank you very much. Sorry for taking much of your time. Uh, those are some of the things that I had to share. Thank you, Masai. Uh... That was quite a mouthful. I don't know that Dr. Mwindi, you, you got all of them. Maybe you could respond to a few and Madam Grace Njagi, if there are things you can also contribute, let us know. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Masai. Uh, I'm going to respond to a few, the ones which uh, I'm able to, and uh, the ones which I'm not able to, as I mentioned, uh, I know there'll be some stakeholders uh, involvement and uh, some of them might be streamlined uh, during that time. There was a question on the non-formal methods. Uh, in a nutshell, I just mentioned the face-to-face -face and, um, and the e-learning. On mentioning face-to-face, -face, uh, because I was just comparing uh, the physical and the e-learning, uh, I know all of us knows what goes into the physical training of uh, FFS. So that's why I did not get into what is inside the face-to-face. -face. But when, we, when I mentioned face-to-face, -face, it incorporates everything that is normally done now, the physical training that we normally do. So all the informal methods of uh, training are inside there. Uh, in, because of time, I could not start explaining one by one, but when I mentioned that, I just meant the physical training that is normally carried out. 
Uh, for sustainability, this one will be captured very well. I know, I know Grace will also have to say something on this, but during the development of the course, sustainability is key. And the development of the course will go all the way from mobilization, starting up ground working, all the way to follow up. And uh, that means also the issues of sustainability is uh, already captured. But this will also be discussed more during the stakeholders and also during the inputting of the document once it's ready. When we talk of uh, institutionalization, we know uh, this is a broad term. There is institutionalization in different institutions in, uh, in the universities and also like, uh, like in uh, fisheries. Uh, we've seen Grace now presenting in fisheries and other institutions. So this one would be tackled uh, in a nutshell within the course as we develop the curriculum and the model. Sorry, sorry. As we develop the curriculum, you'll find that uh, all that will be tackled within the courses before the courses are complete and before all the stakeholders input uh, what they require. Then um, the issue of hands-on experience, as it has been mentioned several times and also mentioned when the, there was a presentation on, on e-learning, e-learning caused by FAO some times ago, it was mentioned very well that as we know the way FFS methodology is, it cannot be 100% e-learning. That's the way we teach commerce, uh, social sciences, et cetera, et cetera. There'll be an aspect of hands on in one way or another. And this is now what is coming up, like what we are doing in the, like in the universities, you find like uh, agricultural courses and other uh, uh, practical, pure and applied courses, you cannot teach all of it uh, online. Something which is coming up, which is called blended learning. They learn what they can learn online but still, they still have to go and practice. So it will be an e-learning, but there'll be an aspect of also the hands-on. So it, the, in, in a better word, uh, later it becomes blended learning. Just similarly to what is happening in our institutions of high learning and also other institutions which are teaching online. There's no way you can teach courses like agriculture, all of it um, by pressing the tab. You still have to go and touch soil, touch the plant, et cetera, et cetera. Um, maybe uh, there was a question on comparing teacher-led and uh, participatory approaches, and I think I've uh, mentioned it a little bit. What I was comparing is just the nutshell of face-to-face -face and uh, e-learning. That uh, in uh, e-learning, uh, in face-to-face, -face, normally what happens, like when I'm training, I'm a master trainer in a class, when students come in the morning, they wait for me to come and start the day. And they wait for me to direct them that we are going to do this topic and this one. It will going to, because the student has a has a self drive. Once he comes to class or once he starts off, he already knows what he wants, the topic he wants to concentrate on. So he's more of learner driven than teacher driven. That's what I meant. Okay, thank you very much, and over to you, Edwin. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mwindi. And maybe to the members, particularly the master trainers in our midst on this platform, as part of the, the course development, we will need content. We will want real videos, real case studies, real experimentation, real ISA diagrams that we can use to enhance this e-learning component. So feel free to share some of these uh, materials, either to me or to the hub, and it will be of benefit to the many who out there who will want to know or want to have some competence in pharma field schools. So please feel free and we'll take credit. We will always uh, uh, announce that uh, this was submitted by so-and-so with this group. So 
all those rights will be that you're entitled to will be ensured that uh, they are protected. So I don't know that we have any other question, but we should be winding up. Uh, and Madam Grace, I don't know whether there's something you can also mention about other types of uh, learning that you might envisage in your program and how the hub can also come and support you. Yeah, thanks Edwin. From our side, uh, I would like to uh, number one say that this, the former field school is a, is a totally new approach. Like I've said previously in fisheries, you are just training fisheries officers and they go back and they, they go to individual farmers for, to see what they are doing in their farms and all that. But now with the FFS approach, we are looking to change how that is being done. And for us being a new project, I think we are in the right time for the hub to support us in how we roll out this and how to ensure that there is even sustainability after the program. Because these are things now we can, even before the midterm review, we can have looked at and we can propose to the donors that we feel this is the way to go. And we are in a, even in a position to request for maybe more funding if need be and all that. So for me, I'm particularly looking for that kind of support because this is a totally new approach in a new program. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Madam Grace. I've seen Alice Njeri from Access Agriculture. Uh, can you unmute yourself and raise your point? Uh, thank you very much. I was just wondering, uh, you've talked about if we have uh, videos or clips, whatever we can send to, to you, which email do we use to do that? Because uh, as Access Agriculture, we have a lot of farmer to farmer uh, training videos um, across South. So how can we share those videos? And maybe how can they be incorporated maybe in the upcoming e-learning um, uh, curriculum that uh, you're trying to develop? Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Madam uh, Alice Njeri. For your information, the Field School Hub already has a partnership arrangement with the uh, Access Agriculture and some of the links that are available online, we some of them we use them for for, for training. Mm -hmm. And the hub was involved actively in the development of the fall arm fall army worm videos. But mm -hmm. through former field schools, the scouting and uh, mechanical crashing. Mm -hmm. The hub was actively involved. So okay. it is good. I've shared our EF field schools. Uh, at gmail.com, but you also have a WhatsApp platform where we share, if it is a short video, not more than five to seven minutes, mm -hmm. you can share it on the WhatsApp group, mm -hmm. but at times you can just send the link. If it, I know most access videos are on YouTube and AgTube. Yeah. yeah. So this will be good. But we are looking at specific areas of, you know, like the non-negotiable principles of FFS, mm -hmm. experimentation, uh, those, mm -hmm comparative studies, we will want somebody to see it real life, you know, like the farmers are experimenting on this variety against this variety. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the things that we'll want. Okay. Not it. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any other contribution? So Max, I think I'll give you this opportunity. We, we wind up. Thank you, Edwin. And thank you so very much, uh, uh, Grace and Esther for sharing such very relevant and vast experience from your side. I, I noted uh, some few things which I don't want to repeat, but I want to only say from um, uh, Dr. Mwindi Esther, that I think we shall discuss again issues of uh, e-learning internally also and how to approach it from 
different contexts, how we deal with the farmers, how we deal with the extension people, the master trainers, and also the managers, so that there is a categorization on and we, as we learn lessons. So I totally agree on blended approach, which definitely brings the core principles of the field school experiential learning, which, which we, we should take uh, on very seriously. So thank you so very much. Uh, for Madam Grace, we are happy uh, for your appreciation of if we could be engaged with you in terms of support. And that is the, the key role that uh, the field school has placed. So we, we can discuss this uh, after the meeting online, what you feel we can do uh, so that myself, Edwin, of course with Esther and others, uh, Baha can be able to avail ourselves to support you with some ideas and maybe some frameworks and also to link ourselves to other regions that are doing similar initiatives on aquaculture field schools. So again, thank you so very much. And to all the participants, we always appreciate your time. We are happy that you are able to join. Without you, we couldn't have, of course, this meeting. So have a blessed day. Let's keep interacting. Every Wednesday, we are on this Zoom. So just make it a culture. You sign in at 10 o'clock, actually 9.55 and we start the discussions and also feel free to write to us if you have anything to share we shall give you the opportunity be blessed and stay safe thank you it is so our maybe culture we, we normally put, put on our edwin your yeah, photo as usual video. yes that's what so Alice, Alice, it's good to hear from you, Alice, and we, we shall get in touch. Access is our great partner, so let's see how we work together. Okay, um, okay. Yeah. Uh, soon after COVID, I should be in Nairobi. <laughs> to again <laughs> You're most enjoy, welcome. Enjoy the ambience of uh, Access Agriculture. You're most welcome to our offices. Thank yes. you. I've okay. always been there, even ah. during the yeah okay so kindly unmute put on your videos we take our last snap where are others ah david yeah we are waiting for this team down here Nathan was here and he kept quiet all through. I have a discussion with the Maasai later on. I, I have not uh, gotten back there. <laughs> there, are some, there is some discussion we need to take on maybe in the, in, at the end Good of time. the week or next week. That is between next us, week. you and <laughs> the hub. <laughs> sawa, sawa. Sawa, sawa. Shaskuru sana. I'm waiting for the last one. Jane Ruheni and Ibenu Sharon. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think we are almost there. Olivia Buire. Olivia and Brenda. And then Samuel, you asked for the master trainers. Get in touch with Atingi and uh, Brenda. We will share okay. the, with you the list that we are having. It's All right. Complete, but we are work in progress. And for the... The master trainers and the team don't sign off. We are joining the meeting with the FAO Uganda again for a few minutes. Sour, sour. Okay, thank you. The rest you are free to, to leave at your own pleasure.
and go to the field and have a, a great day thank you okay let me call